Because the 41st chapter is a long chapter, we'll only be taking two chapters this week, Genesis 40 and 41. So we encourage you to read those over and read through the whole Bible. Join with us then on Sunday evenings as we go through the whole Bible, beginning now in Genesis, this week, chapters 40 and 41. This morning, we'd like to draw your attention to the 41st chapter, verse 51. We find that Joseph has been exalted by the Pharaoh, been given a wife. He is now second in command. And his wife bore him two sons. The first one he named Manasseh. And so we read, And Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh. For God, he said, has made me to forget my toil and all my father's house. The word Manasseh means forgetting. So he named his son after his experience. God has helped me to forget all of the pain, the sorrows, the suffering in my father's house and the afflictions that I've gone through. The second he called Ephraim. For God, he said, has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Ephraim means fruitful. So naming the two boys after his present condition, God has caused me to forget all of the pain and the hardships that I went through. And now God has made me fruitful. Joseph endured many trials. Can you imagine what it must have been to be the youngest of 11 boys and having the 10 older brothers hating you? Can you imagine all of the pain that siblings can bring on you? The lies that they tell, the misery that they put you in? It must have been a difficult thing for Joseph to endure the hatred, the anger of his 10 older brothers, the taunting, the teasing that must have gone on. His brothers hated him enough to kill him. In fact, when they saw Joseph coming to them in the fields, they said, let's kill him. His oldest brother, Reuben, said, oh, we don't want to get our hands bloody. Let's just throw him in this pit. Let him starve to death. And Reuben's idea sort of prevailed. And so when Joseph came to them, they treated him roughly, took off his coat of many colors, threw him in the pit, and then ignored his cries. As they sat and ate their lunch, he could hear them talking about, let's see what happens to him now, all of those dreams that he had of us bowing down to him. Let's see what will come of those. And then he heard them as they sort of changed conversation, as they saw some merchantmen approaching on camels heading towards Egypt. And one of the brothers said, why don't we sell him? We can probably get some money for him and he'll be sold as a slave in Egypt. Let's, let's bargain with these guys. And he heard his brothers bargaining as they agreed to sell him for 20 pieces of silver to these merchant men heading towards Egypt. And as Joseph is bound and is being taken to Egypt, he pleads with his brothers. They see the anguish of his soul but they are so embittered against him, they close their hearts to his cries. And Joseph is taken to Egypt. 
There he is put on the slave market. He is purchased by a captain of the Pharaoh's guard named Potiphar. And Potiphar came to trust Joseph because he was very honest, he was very astute, and he put all of his affairs in Joseph's hands. So he didn't have to worry about anything of the family affairs. Joseph managed so carefully, so well. However, a problem arose because Potiphar's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and decided that she was going to seduce him. And she daily was inviting him to come into her bed. And Joseph steadfastly refused her seductions. But one day he was alone in the house. The servants were gone. And so she decided that she was going to force her intentions on Joseph. She grabbed hold of him. And she said, come to bed with me. And he freed himself from her clutches, but she held on to his robe, but he left it in her hands and fled from the house. Being scorned, she began to scream as the servants came in. She said, look what that Hebrew did that my husband brought into the house. He attempted to rape me. He had taken off his robe and was trying to rape me. And as soon as I screamed, he fled. And I still have his robe. When her husband came home from work that night, she repeated the story to him. He became very angry with Joseph and had him thrown into the king's prison where the king's prisoners were kept. Now, how long a period of time that Joseph was in prison, we do not know. We do know that from the time Joseph was sold by his brothers and became a slave in Egypt in Potiphar's house, and by the time the king's butler and baker were thrown into prison, there were some 11 years that passed by. How many of those years in Potiphar's house as a slave, and how many in prison we are not told. But 11 years have passed by. There in prison, Joseph again, such an honorable, honest young man, found favor with the warden of the prison who gave him a lot of responsibilities to sort of look over the prisoners. And the Pharaoh's butler and Baker were suspicioned in a plot to kill the Pharaoh. And so the Pharaoh had them thrown into prison while investigation was made. One day as Joseph came into the cell with the butler and the baker, he saw that they were looking rather depressed, downcast. He said, what's your problem, fellas? How come you look so downcast? They said, oh, We've had these dreams, and we don't have anybody to interpret them. And Joseph said, well, don't interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the butler said, well, I had a dream, and I was, took three grapes, and I pressed the juice of the three grapes into a cup, and I bore the cup to the Pharaoh. Joseph said, well, that's great. The three grapes are three days. In three days, you'll be exonerated, and you'll be serving the Pharaoh again. When the baker saw that it was a good interpretation, he said, well, in my dream, I had baked three loaves of bread for the Pharaoh. And as I was carrying them to the Pharaoh in a basket on my head, the birds came and ate the bread. Joseph said, bad news, fellow. <laughs> the three loaves of bread are three days. And in three days, the Pharaoh's going to take your head from you. Joseph said to the butler, when you are restored, put in a good word 
for me, will you, to the Pharaoh, tell him of this bum rap that I've got. I was really innocent. And, and just mention me to the Pharaoh. Maybe you can get my sentence communed. But unfortunately, the butler forgot all about Joseph. And two more years passed by while Joseph was still in prison. Now it has been 13 years since his brothers treated him in such a vicious way. But the Pharaoh had a dream. And he called his wise men in to interpret the dream for him, but they weren't able to give him the interpretation of the dream. And the butler said, oh, my sin be upon me. I forgot there's a Hebrew boy in the prison and he is able to give interpretations of dreams. I had a dream and the baker had a dream and he told us the interpretations and it came to pass just like he said. The Pharaoh said, well, bring him in. So they came to the prison and Joseph shaved himself, cleaned up, and he was brought into the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh said, I understand that you can interpret dreams. And Joseph said, well, there's a God who understands all things and he can give the Pharaoh an interpretation of his dream. The Pharaoh said, well, I dreamed the other night that there were these seven fat cows healthy, strong, came out of the Nile River and they were grazing in the meadows. And after them, there came out seven skinny, scrawny cows. And the skinny, scrawny cows ate up the fat cows, but were no healthier by doing so, no fatter. And then I dreamed that there were seven sheaves of grain with beautiful shocks of wheat. And there were seven other sheaves that were looked like they had been blighted by the east wind, just scrawny. But the scrawny ones ate up the seven good ones. Joseph said, the two dreams are actually one. The Lord is showing you that there will be seven years of prosperity and plenty in the land of Egypt. We're going to have bumper crops, going to be seven years of abundance. But these seven years of abundance will be followed by seven lean years, drought, famine. And the famine will be so great that it will eat up all of the surpluses that are developed in the seven good years. He said, I recommend to you, Pharaoh, that you appoint a man that during the seven good years, you build storage sheds, barns, to lay up the surplus during the seven good years so that you'll be able to survive the seven lean years that are coming. The Pharaoh said, great idea. And then he said to his servants, can we find a man as capable as this man who has the spirit of God? Pharaoh said to Joseph, inasmuch as God has showed you all of this, there is none as discreet and wise as you. So you shall be over my house, and according to your word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand. That would be his signet ring. And he arrayed him in vestures of fine linen, and he put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in a second chariot, which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee. And he made him the ruler over all of the land of Egypt. Joseph, at this time, was 30 years old. 
The Pharaoh also gave to him a wife who bore him these two sons, the first he named Forgetting. Now in this time of great exaltation, second ruler over all of Egypt, God in the prosperity and in the blessings, he said, has caused me to forget those painful years that I went through. And God has now made me very fruitful. So he called the second son fruitful, Ephraim, because God has made me so fruitful. As we look at the life of Joseph, from this vantage point, we can now see that the Lord's hand was in all of the adversities that Joseph faced, those even bad experiences. God's hand was behind it all. God knew years ago that there would be a seven-year famine period that would just devastate all of that area. And because of Jacob and his family, God wanted to preserve them during this time of famine. So God caused the brothers of Joseph to conspire to sell him to the merchants heading toward Egypt to sell him for 20 pieces of silver as a slave. God caused Potiphar to purchase Joseph there in the slave market. And God caused Potiphar's wife to try to seduce Joseph and to cry rape when she failed so that Joseph was thrown into the king's prison because Potiphar was one of the officers of the Pharaoh. God caused the butler and the baker of Pharaoh to be thrown into the prison so they could meet Joseph. God caused the butler to be exonerated and returned to his duties of serving the Pharaoh. God gave to Pharaoh the dream two years later, and the butler again two years later remembered this Hebrew boy in the prison that he had forgotten all about. Had the butler immediately recommended Joseph to the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh released him, he probably would have headed right back home to his father Jacob and his brothers. But because the Pharaoh had this dream and Joseph was then brought to interpret it, he was still there available to interpret the dream. And because God gave to him the interpretation of the dream, suddenly Joseph is highly exalted and he is given a place in Egypt second only to the Pharaoh. Blessed beyond measure. Now forgetting all of the hard, difficult experiences because of the glory of the position that he now has. Enjoying his wife and his boys. He's been blessed above measure. He has discovered that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All of the past pains are forgotten. The seeming tragedies, he sees that they were all a part of God's plan. Looking back, as the hymn we sang, all the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? And looking back, he could see that God's hand was in each one of these experiences, though at the time that he was going through them, they seemed devastating. They seemed so tragic. But now he can see God's hand 
in those things. If you have committed your life to the Lord, you can be sure that all things are working together for good. God is working even in those painful places, those difficult times. God is at work. And you need to put your faith and your trust in God. One day, when the cycle is complete, you will see the full purposes of God and you'll forget all of the painful experiences that brought you to that place of fruitfulness. If we could see beyond today as God does see, then all of our tears we would wipe away. Our sorrows would flee. Or these present griefs we would not fret. Each sorrow we would soon forget because many joys are waiting yet for you and for me. God said to Jeremiah to write to the captives in Babylon. To just settle down there in Babylon. They're going to be captive there for 70 years. So plant vineyards. Make the best of it. You're going to be there a while. But the Lord said, tell them that he has plans for them. Plans to prosper them, not to harm them. Plans to give them a hope and a future. God's message. I've got good plans for you, not evil. I plan to prosper you. I have plans for a good future for you. These present experiences are necessary. They're the necessary training really of our lives in preparing us for that which God has and desires to do for us in the future. But herein lies a great problem. So many times as we are going through these difficult, painful experiences in life that we can't understand, Satan so often takes advantage of our lack of understanding and of the painful experiences to convince us that God doesn't care, that God doesn't love us. And it is at this time that many people give up their faith in God because they can't understand the adverse circumstances that they are going through. Ted Turner, a name that is familiar to all of you, when he was a young man had made a commitment of his life to Jesus Christ. His sister became deathly ill and he prayed earnestly that God would heal his sister, but she died. And when his sister died, because he couldn't rationalize why didn't God answer my prayer and heal her, he turned his back and his heart against God and became bitter against God. It's tragic because so many people do the same thing. Coming again against the circumstances that we do not know and we do not understand, oftentimes people turn their back upon God and they never then see the good plan that God has even in the adverse circumstances. And that is a tragedy indeed. Job said, the Lord knows the way that I take. And of course, talk about a guy who went through all kinds of calamity. Job sort of is the king of calamity. <laughs> and he said, the Lord knows the way that I take. 
And when I am tried, I'm going to come forth as gold. We read at the end of the book of Job, at the end of the life of Job, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 sheep donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And of all of the girls, there was none that were fairer than Job's daughters. You know, it's a blessing. And, and Job knew that. He hung on. He hung on in his trust and faith in God. I know that when I'm tried, I'm going to come forth like gold. No, I don't understand why I'm going through all of these painful experiences. I don't know why I've lost everything. I don't know why my children were all wiped out. I don't know why I'm going through these physical conditions of, of just absolute misery. But I know that when I'm tried, I'm going to come forth like gold. You that are going through difficulties today, do you know that when you're through, you're going to come forth like gold? God, when he brings out his full purpose, when the cycle is complete, is going to bring you into the place of blessing so great that you'll be forgetting all of the painful experiences of the past. God has caused me to forget, Joseph said. Call his name Manasseh, forgetting. He's a reminder for me to forget all of the painful things that I went through. The second son, all oh, call him fruitfulness. Look at how God has blessed me, how fruitful my life has become. If we could see, if we could know, we often say, but God in love a veil does throw across our way. We cannot see what lies before, and so we cling to him the more. Is that the case in your life? when you can't see, when you're going through deep waters, when you're passing through the fiery trials, does it cause you to just deepen that relationship with God and your trust in him? I can't see it. I don't know what he's doing, but I'm just going to trust him all the more. And so we cling to him the more. He'll lead us till this life is o'er. Just trust. Years later, when Jacob, Joseph's father, died, the brothers then panicked. They felt that now he's going to get even with us for those dastardly things that we did to him when he was growing up. And so they went in before Joseph. They bowed themselves in obeisance to him and pleaded for mercy. And they volunteered to become his slaves, just spare our lives. And Joseph said to them, fear not, for I am, am I in the place of God? I know that you thought evil against me, but God intended it for good in order to bring to pass as it is this day to save his people alive. I know that your thoughts, your heart was wrong. You were intending evil for me, but God was overruling, and God meant it for good. God wanted to save his people alive. He could look back now, now that the cycle is complete, now that the picture is complete, he can see now the hand of God and the purposes of God being wrought through the hard, painful experiences of life. I've often said that one of the advantages of being as old as I am, the picture is almost complete. And I can look back and I can see those painful experiences, those great disappointments, those times of sorrow, times when I was discouraged, almost ready to give up. 
Now that the cycle is just about complete, I can see God's hand in all of those things. God was preparing me because he wanted to bring me into a place of fruitfulness such as I had never, ever dreamed. <clears throat> Do you think that I sit home at night and just sit in the chair and think of all of the miserable things I went through all my life <laughs> as God was training me? You know, just, oh boy, remember that, oh, that was horrible, oh, you know. <laughs> if you think I do that, you're missing it. <laughs> I mean, I'm just so overwhelmed with the blessings of God and the goodness of God. And I realized that that was all a part of God's necessary plan in order to bring me into the place of fruitfulness that he has today. And so, as Paul said, I rejoice in my weaknesses. I rejoice in those things because I can see God's hand now. He was working all the time, even when I didn't know it. And God is working in your life today, and you may be going through some of those difficulties right now. It may be that there's a lot of pressure on you and there's a lot of discouragement because of what's been happening lately. But God is working. And when you are tried, like Job, if you will hang on and trust in God, you'll come forth like gold. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this beautiful illustration of the text that says all things work together for good to those who love God. Lord, we do love you. And we thank you, Lord, that you are working in our lives. And though often we do not understand, Lord, what you are doing, we pray that you'll continue your work until that day when we are able to see your full purpose and plan. And we enter into the joy of the fruitfulness of those plans that you had for us from the beginning. Lord, there are some today that are experiencing such great sorrow and pain, going through heavy trials. They're pressed to the limits. Lord, give them that faith to just trust in you, that you might bring them forth, Lord, like gold that's been purified in the fire, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here in the front this morning to pray for you. And if you are going through a particularly difficult time, I would encourage you to come on forward as soon as we're dismissed. They'll be happy to pray for you and pray that God will bring you through this time and bring you into that place of fruitfulness where you can see the plan and the purpose of God even in the heavy trial. And so I would encourage you, come and be prayed for. If you are not following the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't have that comfort. You can't say, well, it's all working together for good. It could be working together for disaster. Could be that God's setting you up for the big fall. The promise all things work together for good are to those that love him. And maybe you'd like to get on his side. You'd like to begin to serve God. You'd like to be called according to his purpose. I would encourage you to come forward. They'll be glad to pray for you. And then you can take all of these things 
adverse circumstances and you can say, well, God is working in them and one day I'll forget all about these miseries as I come into the fruitful place that God has prepared me for and is preparing for me. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and, keep thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his countenance. Now, on behalf of the Word for Today, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Chuck Smith, we thank you for joining us in today's broadcast. For more of Pastor Chuck's studies and biblical teaching resources, visit our website at pastorchuck.org. You can contact the Word for Today at the Word for Today, P.O. Box 890-820, Temecula, California, 92589 or email us at infopastorchuck at gmail.com. We'll return with more of our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study in our next broadcast with Pastor Chuck.